Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mirbat al Asnaj. I'm an interventional cardiologist and working for PCR online. And we're bringing you the latest breaking clinical trials presented at ACC 2024. And with me today is a very important trial. With me is the primary investigator, Professor Jacob Muller. He is a professor at Odense University in Denmark and a consultant at the Cardiac Critical Care Unit in Copenhagen. He will tell us about the Danger trial, shock trial, which we've all been waiting for anxiously for quite some time. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So as I understand it, the Danger study um, was the objective was to assess the efficacy of transvalvular axial flow mechanical circulatory support in patients who had acute myocardial infarctions complicated by cardiogenic shock and undergoing primary PCI. Um, you know, the primary endpoint was all was all causes through death from all causes through 180 days in a Attention to treat and all randomized patients, of course, were consented. And your second endpoint, secondary endpoint, was a composite of the events that need additional mechanical support, cardiac transplantation, and again, death of all causes, whichever of these comes first. And of course, days alive um, and out of hospital. So um, you also got a composite safety endpoint with this, including major bleeding, vascular complications, device malfunctions, and damage to the aortic valve or hemolysis. But before we dive into the results, I think it's important for us to address a question that many of us have been um, you know, struggling with, is that it's very difficult to enroll patients with cardiogenic shock. And it did take quite some time for the Danger Shock trial to enroll the study population that was necessary to achieve the power um, to, to, for the results. So when did you start recruitment and could you expand on the difficulties that as investigators you encountered when conducting this trial? Uh, yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, the study uh, had an enrollment time of 10 years. So that's a very long time and there, uh, several reasons, but the foremost important reason for this was our enrollment criteria was much stricter than many of the other trials. So so it's it's a balance between getting enough patients in with uh, not too much heterogeneity. And uh, in the most of the trials uh, that are out there have enrolled patients with cardiac arrest, um, and we did not. Uh, and that's basically the main reason it took such a long time. During our enrollment period, we enrolled 360 patients, and we excluded 451 patients due to out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And I still, even though it took us 10 years, think that that was the right decision to do that because the flow pump will not save the brain from uh, a brain injury that happened outside the hospital. So, so if I had to do it over again, we would still exclude these patients, but we would have more sites doing, doing the, the, the study. And that was the other thing. We start, started off uh, four sites in Denmark and uh, had little funding. And it was not until we got funding to be able to expand the study, we were able to, able to finalize it. So uh, the past four and a half years, we enrolled about 60% of the population. So even though it took a long time, most patients are quite contemporary. But it's the cardiac arrest that made the, the difference. And so since it took 10 years, the sky classification of shock didn't actually come out until recent years. So how did you standardize your definition of shock uh, in, in these years? For us, it was mandatory to uh, have an objective measure of hypoperfusion. So all patients had to have a lactate of more than 2.5 uh, at enrollment and, a, of course, a low blood pressure. We also did an echo to ensure that there was not uh, LV thrombus, uh, mechanical complication or overt right uh, ventricular failure. 
uh, but but we made sure that all patients were in at least sky class uh, C and uh, about uh, uh, going back uh, applying sky classes we have 55 percent in sky class C and the the, the rest is D's or E's um, but that's of course not pre uh, defined how how this was uh, uh, how would this was done because there were no spy classes when we started. So could you walk us through the design very quickly of your study and then the most relevant um, findings? Yeah, I, our study was also uh, designed before this uh, discussion about uh, unloading the heart before revascularization. But, but our strategy was to start unloading when we diagnosed shock. So, so the key is that we randomized when shock was there and with the increased lactate. So this could be before uh, PCI, which was in 57% of cases. It could be uh, while in the cath lab, or it could be up to 12 hours after leaving the cath lab. We ended up randomizing 85% of the population within the cath lab. And uh, as I said, 57% were free PCI. And if uh, if randomized free PCI to Impella, 90% uh, got the device there. So so we 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 started unloading when we saw shock. And um, Doing such a study, even though there is no evidence for uh, mechanical circulatory support, I think most interventionalists uh, would be very re reluctant to randomize a 50-year-old male with a blood pressure of 65 if you don't have a back uh, support plan. So all patients could be escalated to VA ECMO at uh, any time. And this was also done in both uh, patients uh, within the Impella group and in the patients in the uh, standard of care group. So what were the, the results of the Dengar shock trial? So uh, the results uh, showed us that we had a significant reduction in all-cause mortality at 180 days. So mortality was uh, reduced by absolute 13 and relative 26%, which was statistically significant. Uh, we saw a, a reduction in the secondary endpoint, which was escalation to uh, short or long-term mechanical support, transplantation or death, with a, a relative reduction of the uh, uh, 28%. We did not see a difference in days alive out of hospital. We saw more patients being long, longer in hospital in the impeller group. So at day 30, 20% of the uh, uh, impeller group were still in hospital and it was 11% in the standard of care group. Uh, so we saw longer hospitalizations uh, in the uh, in the impeller group. On the other hand, the, the, the backside of this is that when you put a device in like the impeller, there will be complications. There will be bleeding, there will be limb ischemia, uh, and uh, we also saw excess of uh, these complications in, uh, in our trial. Uh, so the composite endpoint, uh, safety endpoint was seen in 24% in the uh, impeller group and 6% uh, in the uh, control room. So uh, even though there was a mortality benefit, there is a harm of uh, also, um, but but at the end of the day, we, we, we save lives uh, with this strategy. Yeah, so I suppose the extended length of stay or the hospitalization with the impeller can be explained by um, the additional um, potential complications related to the device yeah. itself. We, right? we saw somewhat unexpected that the need for renal replacement therapy 
was greater in the impeller group and whether this was related to hemolysis or, or what, we don't know, but something we will look, look into uh, as well. Uh, so I think this, this is, an, of course, an important step forward and the first study for uh, many, many years uh, that shows survival benefit, but it also raises uh, questions and we really have to address the complication rates of, of these devices. So were there any, um, I understand there were additional subgroup analyses like based on hemodynamics, metabolic, um, hematologic, and even renal, as you mentioned. Yeah. So, um, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about these? Um, what we saw was that the benefit of the device was greater if the patient was uh, admitted was multivessel disease. So patients that had more than one diseased vessel had greater uh, the benefit than those with uh, single vessel disease, which I think make good uh, sense. We also saw the patients that came in with the lowest blood pressure, so uh, a blood pressure less than the median, which was uh, 82 systolic blood pressure at randomization, had a significantly greater uh, effect of the treatment than patients with a higher blood pressure which again, I think uh, makes good sense. We did not see that uh, there was uh, any interaction with sky class or uh, lactate uh, level uh, at, um, at admission. Was there any crossover um, between? Yeah, uh, we had the 1.7% crossover from the standard of care to the impeller group. So three patients, were treated with impeller CP, and uh, we had three patients that didn't undergo the impeller CP treatment because it was felt that they uh, recovered too fast. Um, so the rate of crossover is very low and, and much lower than in the other studies that are out there. So were there any confounders that you believe may make these results difficult to apply in a real world population? Um, I, I think the most important lesson or the most important is not to extrapolate this, to realize how selected this patient population is. So so we it would be a, a, a mistake, I think, to extrapolate this to patients coming in with uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, other causes of uh, uh, cardiogenic shock, because the, the harm will, will still be there, and we don't know if the benefit uh, will, will, will be there. So, so I would, would be really, really, really cautious to, to uh, just uh, say now that all patients with cardiogenic shock should have, a, have an impeller that would, this is definitely not uh, the message of the study. So, you know, given the caution that you just told us about, do you think it's time for the guidelines to change based on the Danger Shock trial? I think uh, the, the guidelines should, uh, should acknowledge that there are patients that can benefit uh, from, from this. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that one study can call for class one indi indication. Uh, I think there need to be more studies, but uh, but uh, but there are patients that benefit and that should be acknowledged. I, I, I think um, we will still be restrictive in my institution uh, and uh, only uh, use it for the selected cases. Well, I really want to thank you for your time and I want to congratulate you and the remainder of your co-investigators for this trial. It was very difficult to conduct and the results were really much awaited and um, needed by our community. My final question to you before we wrap up, you sort of started mentioning that in your unit, you're going to be more conservative. So could you just give us a brief outline on what you do in your unit with cardiogenic shock patients? What is your algorithm at this time? 
Yeah, I think I think our algorithm for a STEMI patient that comes in is that we immediately take a blood gas, evaluate the lactate, we immediately do a, a, a echo with the patient on, on the in the cath lab just to get an idea of uh, the cardiac output, any mechanical complications, the RV function. Then we take a decision whether or not we believe this patient is a candidate for for mechanical circulatory support at all. Um, and some patients are, some patients are not, out of various reasons. Uh, but but that I decision is extremely important. And then we have a discussion uh, whether to start uh, unloading before or if if we want to go for the PTI first. Uh, but I think the most important is to have the team around the patient do the basic evaluation, Who is to decide who is the enemy, is it the low cardiac output, and then have a plan there. And I think we will continue using the uh, danger shock criteria uh, when we do that, and we believe very strongly in the lactate and would be hesitant uh, to uh, to place the device in anybody with a normal lactate. Well, thank you so much. This was very insightful. And to our viewers, I want to refer you to the New England Journal of Medicine with a simultaneous publication uh, for more details. And thank you for watching and stay with us with the other day break of trials.